Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jennifer Lezak, Coordinator of Special Projects with the Adult Services Department. And on behalf of everyone at the Chicago Public Library, welcome. We're so pleased to welcome photographer Jeffrey Woolen tonight to talk about his new book and exhibit, Faces of Homelessness. Jeff will be joined by an esteemed panel of guests, including Alderman Matt Martin, Doug Shekelberg, Ronald Matthews, and Melanie Cerna. During the program, we invite you to leave your questions, comments, and reflections in the chat. And we'll ask some questions during the Q&A at the end of the conversation. Tonight's event is co-sponsored by the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless, and we thank them for all of their work in making tonight's event happen. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce Doug Schecklenberg, Executive Director, Chicago Coalition for the Homeless, and welcome our panel to the CPL virtual stage. Welcome. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, and thanks so much to the Chicago Public Library for co-hosting this amazing event this evening. Uh, as Jennifer mentioned, my name is Doug Schenkelberg. I am the Executive Director of the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless. The Coalition is an over 40-year-old organization whose mission is to organize and advocate to prevent and end homelessness because housing is a human right in a just society. And we're really pleased to be able to be partners with Jeff Wollin on this project and all our amazing panelists uh, and be able to share a great panel discussion with you this evening. So to get us started, let's start out with some introductions. Um, let me uh, ask each of you to uh, share who you are and share your connection to the project and or the Coalition for the Homeless. Let's start with Jeff. My name is Jeffrey Woolen. I'm a photographer. I taught photography at Indiana University in Bloomington for many years and uh, retired a few years ago. I approached uh, Doug uh, Schenkelberg uh, at the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless a few years ago. And uh, what you'll see tonight is the result of that, uh, of that partnership. Great, thanks, Jeff. Uh, Ronald. Good afternoon. My name is Ronald Matthews. I'm a grassroots leader with the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless. I was previously homeless, and I am one of the subjects of Jeff Woolen's project. Thanks, Ronald. Melody. Honey Vujo, my name is Melody Serna. I am the current executive director here at the American Indian Center of Chicago, which is the oldest urban Indian center in the country. I'm also one of Jeffrey's uh, photography subjects on the project. Great, thank you, Melody. And Alderman Mark. Hi, everybody. I'm Matt Martin. I'm the older person in the 47th Ward uh, in my first term, and I work very closely with CCH and other advocates on issues around affordable housing and homelessness throughout the 47th Ward in the entire city. Great, thank you so much, Alderman. So Jeff, let's start with you. Um, why did you decide to photograph people experiencing homelessness? And why did you approach Chicago Coalition for the Homeless to help? So uh, I, as I mentioned, I, I taught at Indiana University and my a lot of my professional connections were here in Chicago. My gallery where the exhibition, Face of Homelessness is now currently on display, Catherine Edelman Gallery. Uh, I've been working with her for over 30 years on my various uh, exhibitions and, uh, and series. So um, I moved to Chicago, and, and then so I had connections to Chicago. And when I retired from my job at, at Indiana University, I really wanted to have a different experience. I wanted to live in a city and I, I grew to love Chicago for its culture and its food and its ethnicity and its architecture. And I wanted to be here. And so uh, not just here, but we moved downtown uh, five, seven years ago, six, seven years ago, we moved downtown. And um, when I would uh, wander around the streets in my neighborhood, uh, it was, there were many homeless people on the streets, uh, many asking for money, some aggressive, some not. And I was curious about them, about their faces, about their stories. How did they wind up here in this, in, in this place at this time? And so uh, I've dealt with trauma in, uh, in my previous bodies of work, which in, involved photographing Holocaust survivors, war veterans, uh, people living in a housing project in Bloomington, Indiana over a period of time. And so I, it, it, what was I gonna do for my Chicago project now that I'm living here? And it occurred to me, well, I could do something with homelessness, but I'm not the sort of photographer who would just grab his camera and see somebody sleeping on a heating grate and take a really cool picture you know, and leave. Uh, I, I, I needed to learn more about the problem. And so I did a little research, found out that CCH is one of the most important and, and valuable uh, organizations in terms of dealing with the homeless crisis. 
anywhere in the country. And so I approached Doug. Uh, I was uh, didn't expect much. Uh, you know, I was just, I am this retired photography professor and I did this work before. And uh, I, I would like to learn more about homelessness and maybe partner with you. And if you could help me find homeless people to photograph. Well, uh, to my surprise, Doug called a meeting with his fabulous staff and, and said, let's do this. So that was four years ago. And, and here we are today. That's great. Thank you so much, Jeff. And we're so pleased that you reached out to us to begin with. Um, let's shift to uh, looking at some of the images and stories. Um, and we're going to start with, you know, Melody and Ronald, you're both featured in uh, the book. So why don't we start with uh, Melody um, sharing your story, and then we'll shift to Ronald. Sure. Um, again, my name is Melody Serna. Uh, so my text reads, I was a hospital corpsman third class in the United States Navy, and I'm a fifth generation Native American vet. My great grandfather served in Big Red One, which is the first infantry division. He was from the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians in Belcourt, North Dakota. At that time, he wasn't even considered a citizen as the US didn't grant citizenship to Native Americans until 1924. My great aunt was a whack in the army in World War II. My great uncle served in Vietnam. My grandfather served in Korea. I served at the tail end of Desert Storm, Desert Shield, and I served in a conflict zone in Haiti in 1998. Her family has been in every war since the Revolutionary War. I was sexually assaulted at Naval Medical Center in San Diego after being roofied. I was taken back to my room and endured a trauma that changed my life forever. Everyone on the base started pointing at me. She's a liar and she deserved it. I convinced them to transfer me to another base and there was an altercation at a bar that triggered my PTSD and I was wrongfully charged. The Innocence Project thankfully intervened and the case was overturned. I got pregnant with my first son right after I got home and I stayed in San Diego for six years after that. My husband was an abusive drunk who tried to kill me on multiple occasions. I moved back to Chicago in 2006 and I got into another abusive relationship. Since 2008, we, as in me and my children, um, we've faced small bouts of homelessness. I wound up staying with my abusive boyfriend. When we were homeless, we stayed doubled up with friends and family. When I couldn't stay with friends, I'd call my ex and ask for help with rent, food, rides. I know that I shouldn't have called him. He beat me, stalked me, and even tried to kill me. I still have the scars as a reminder that I'm not a victim, but a survivor. I felt at the time that I had no choice. I'm a single mom of three. My son has special needs and required multiple therapies and tutoring. I finally got into the VA system a couple years ago and my family was picked and placed into a housing by Volunteers of America. Being homeless doesn't define me, but surviving it does. Thank you. Ronald, can you share your story now? Yes, Doug. My path to homelessness began in August of 2015 when my condo was foreclosed and I just had 30 days to vacate. I didn't have an exit plan or anywhere to go. For a couple of years, I was doubled up with my 80 year old sister. Then I spent another year with my great niece and her husband. Eventually I had to return back to my sisters until it became imperative that I move on. So I went to Pacific Gardens mission. One of the most challenging times of my life was living at Pacific Garden. I was there for 331 days, and it was a life-altering, eye-opening experience. One might compare the experience to being incarcerated, only because of the metal-style bunk beds, showering with other men, having to line up for meals and other privileges, and the strict rules enforced by men who at one time had been residents themselves. They oftentimes seemed to be mean and insensitive, but they were just doing their jobs. Nevertheless, I am internally grateful for PGM and other shelters that they exist, but one cannot live in this environment forever. 
This is why the advocacy for more permanent, affordable, and supportive housing is imperative. I had a job since I was 14 and always felt self-sufficient, but homelessness does not take any of that into consideration. It doesn't care what your past was. It constantly reminds you that this is your present world and it forces you to be in unf unfamiliar environments, to learn new survival skills and rely on your faith and the help of others to get you through. You're reduced to your lowest level of existence. The situations are uncertain, frightening, dangerous, and uncomfortable. Shelters provide an indoor space, but there are limitations. Housing two or 300 residents at a time has specific challenges for a multitude of reasons. Some residents suffer from mental illness, lack of adequate social skills, lack of good hygiene, and have violent tendencies, even a combination of all of those melodies. Oftentimes I was on high alert because I could never be certain how others would behave in certain situations. While I was at PGM, I had pneumonia twice. In 2018, I spent Christmas Eve and Christmas Day in the hospital with the second bout. In April 2019, as we were learning more about COVID, I was sent to Hotel 166 located on the Gold Coast. This was due to Mayor Lightfoot's initiative to house the vulnerable population away from shelters to a place where they could be in isolation. The Chicago Coalition for the Homeless played a major role in ensuring that I was on that list to be sent to the hotel. At the hotel, everyone was tested for COVID. Two days later, I learned that I had it, but my symptoms were minor. The isolation and the quietness of a luxury hotel was quite healing, but hyper boring. Then suddenly, 13 days later, I realized that I had a sense of smell again. When I got back to Pacific Gardens, I was placed in segregation for another 14 days, along with others who were recuperating from COVID. During those 14 days, I received two phone calls back to back regarding available apartments. This was the best news I had received for a very long time. By God's grace, for nearly two years now, I occupy a beautiful apartment in Bronzeville. I could not be more grateful. This is where I'm supposed to be. Thank you, Ronald. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Jeff, could you take us through some more of the, the photos from your book? Sure, uh, let's see, okay. So this uh, portrait is of Maxica and her three beautiful children. And I'm gonna read just very briefly her, uh, her story. She was one of the very first people that I photographed. She's a leader uh, of the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless. Those are people who've experienced homelessness in the past who go out now into the shelters and help currently homeless people find resources. And they also do advocacy for uh, homeless issues. They'll go down to Springfield uh, and, and uh, lobby with legislators. They'll, uh, uh, they, they, we, I met them, uh, worked with them at the Bring Chicago Home uh, press conference at, the, at City Hall. And uh, let me just read a little bit of this. Three years ago, I had a double mastectomy and 16 nodes removed from my left arm. I had six months of chemotherapy. I was in the process of buying a house, but had to use the money for my chemo. During that time, I cared for my kids, took them to school each day. I'll graduate in May of 2019 with a degree in business administration, then go on for my master's. I wanna work with homeless and cancer survivors to help them deal with their problems and to pay back what they did for me. And um, I can happily report that Maxica just received her master's and uh, I'm scheduled to do her graduation portrait, which is, which is an honor for me. I love the way she dressed up herself and the kids in these beautiful uh, outfits to be photographed. And you can tell they're a very close loving family and her, and her personal strength comes through. Okay, next. This is Tom and I met Tom at, a, at the CCH news conference, the rally for Bring Chicago Home. Uh, and uh, we've become friends that's now almost a couple of years, oh, no, two and a half, almost three years. <laughs> and uh, it's an interesting story. He, he writes, or 
I'll read. First time I was homeless, I was 14 years old. I was kicked out of the house. There were seven of us kids. I was the oldest. My dad died when I was six, my mom when I was 12. I'd heard about Uptown Tent City and I wanted to totally get involved. Got a propane stove and tank and started cooking for the community. Set up a storage tent to keep things for survival purposes. There were about 25 of us under Lawrence Viaduct and about 20 under Wilson. I got elected mayor of Tent City. I'm homeless, but I'm happy. I'm doing what I enjoy, helping people. And so you can see in his story, uh, this is one of the drivers of homelessness, uh, loss, of, loss of loved ones, loss of parents. He was, what, 12 years old when his, when his mother died and his father had already died. And so he, he wound up on the streets at the age of 14, which is tragic. Um, he's the mayor of Uptown. Everyone loves this guy. <laughs> and uh, he's, he's just a sweetheart. We're still friends and we do lunch every, every couple of months. And, uh, and he tells me what, what's going on in his life and what's going on in Tent City. Um, and Tent Cities are, uh, for many people, a viable way of living uh, without permanent shelter. Uh, it provides support, protection, community. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Okay, Cecilia. And I met Cecilia through uh, Brighton Park Neighborhood Council, a wonderful organization here in Chicago. And she was a survivor of domestic violence and is a single mom with three kids. And I, ju I just love uh, the triple portrait with her shirt and the mural referencing Our Lady of Guadalupe, the Virgin Mary. Um, so she actually came to the opening at Catherine Edelman Gallery in December and all of the people in attendance uh, gathered around and she talked about where she came from, where she was living now, what it was like to live doubled up with her parents and her uh, and the fact that there it had been two years since I took her portrait and she had, was homeless living doubled up with her parents, that she had her own place, that she had a job and she was doing fabulous. She started to cry, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. But, uh, but let me um, just, just say that that's a driver of a lot of homelessness and especially invisible homelessness is, is surviving domestic violence, leaving abusive relationships and living with friends and family. This is a, a little, a short piece that was written about the, this portrait in a, in a journal. And this is the guy, Christoph Ermscher, he's a scholar who wrote the introduction to the book. Okay, consider Cecilia Flores, who has positioned herself next to a colorful Dia de los Muertos mural featuring a classic woman's face in white makeup, lips stitched shut. The sweater Cecilia has chosen for the picture shows Our Lady of Guadalupe, both images broadcast female, female resilience. The Day of the Dead celebrates the empowering presence of the dead, while the Guadalupe story, in its essence, is about a woman ordering around two men, a Mexican peasant and his bishop, so that a church will be built in her honor. Taken together, the wall, Cecilia's shirt, and Cecilia herself, the image acquires additional meaning, showing, quote, yourself and your children that mommy can do it, unquote, end quote, might seem given the circumstances, a task beyond the capabilities of one person, which is why this photograph gives us not one, but three faces, Cecilia multiplied, a real superwoman. Strong in spirit, Cecilia is homeless only in a technical sense. While Wolin never minimizes the soul crushing reality of the experience of homelessness, he wants to emphasize that his subjects deserve the viewer's respect and admiration. Okay, the last one. Um. Well, let's shift from this. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and shift to another question to follow up with Melody and Ronald. And again, thank you so much to both of you for sharing the stories that um, are in the book with your photos. Can each of you share why you decided to be part of this project and talk publicly about the details about your life? Um, Melody, let's start with you. Um, so I was introduced to Jeffrey through um, a mutual colleague. Um, I was actually at a veterans event and I was meeting, uh, discussing PTSD and some art projects. Um, and I was uh, told about Jeffrey's projects. Um, I think the basis really for myself um, and Jeffrey's project is really 
the core of who I am is, is public service, whether that was in the military or community service, educational advocacy, parent advocacy. My story, I just felt if it could help someone, um, then I was doing something right. I think what I learned in doing this project is that I didn't think of the larger ramifications of when I did this project. Um, you know, I was homeless at the time. You know, I, I was literally homeless, trying to figure it out and was sitting with coffee and Jeffrey and I felt invigorated and I never thought in doing the project, how, you know, amazing the project would be one and that then we'd turn into a book and now, you know, we're kind of everywhere. And I didn't think of what that would look like now for me in the position I sit in. And not very many people know my full story. Um, my children don't know my story. And now my children know my story. Um, my community now knows my story because <laughs> it's out there. And I'm not ashamed of my story, um, but it is my story. And I think the resiliency of, as a Native woman, for me, as a Hispanic woman and a Native woman, as a woman of color, I think it's important for people to just genuinely understand that faces of homelessness are so vast and they are so diverse. And, you know, I'm not just a veteran with PTSD. I'm not just a single mom. I'm not, you know, just another woman of color, or not just a domestic violence victim. You know, I'm a survivor of all of these things. I'm, I've gotten past those things. And I think if I can share that, one person can feel empowered. Um, and if that can shed light on, um, how anyone can become homeless, then I think I've done my job. Great, thanks, Melody. Uh, Ronald, can you share? Sure, thanks, Melody. Like Melody, I, um, I began to share my story at the urging of Keith Freeman, who has now passed away, who was a community organizer at this coalition. He, he was a very dear person, he was like, a friend to me, a friend who stuck closer than a brother. And he was always encouraging me to do something, to tell my story, to be out there because he saw something in me that I didn't. I am not one to really tell my story. I'm not one to talk about it. I mean, I've been in this building almost two years and I don't think there's two people that know that I came from a homeless environment. The management company doesn't know. But now that I'm, I'm in with both feet and I'm looking fast forward. I can see the value of telling my story, of sharing my story, because I can help somebody. I can help somebody through the difficult times. I can encourage them. I can help them see that they are not in this alone, that they can make it through. Um, being in this environment and being in a position to be able to share my story of survival, reminds me of a gospel song, um, a song that was sung by Mahalia Jackson, and it goes, I'm not gonna sing it, <laughs> but the words go something like, <laughs> if I could just help somebody, if I could just touch somebody, my life shall not be in vain. And that's, that's what it's all about for me. I mean, now um, I, I seek opportunities where I could just help. I can't do much, I don't have money to give, but I have time. And this is so ironic, just the other day, there's a lady in the building in the lobby was sitting there, I don't know her name, but I bet you she knows mine. And she said, hey, come here. And I said, what? And she said, I just wanna tell you, you've got a wonderful spirit. You're always smiling and you're always doing something. You're always helping people. And that just blew me away. I didn't know that people were watching. And that's something that my colleague from a long time ago, and I hope she's watching, she told me a long time ago, she says, you're a teacher, not necessarily in front of the classroom, but people are watching you and they're learning from you. And that's where I'm at right now. I just wanna help somebody. That's great, Raul. Thanks so much for sharing that. Uh, Melody, you talked in your story about how you lived doubled up with friends and family. Can you talk a little bit about what that means and what is important for people to know about the experience of living doubled up? Yeah, I mean, 
I think people don't really, uh, like you said, they don't understand what doubled up is. And unfortunately for me, I didn't have family. Um, so it was really um, kind of friends. It was people that I had hoped would help. Right. Um, I had been through like Ronald. I actually know Pacific Gardens and I actually couldn't stay there because I have two boys who were over the age. And they're like, well, your boys can be on this side. and You and your daughter can be over here. Well, my boys had special needs, so I couldn't leave them. So we were in a car or, you know, multiple things. And, you know, you're knocking on your friend's door. Hey, can we stay here for a night? Hey, can we stay here for a couple of days? I got really lucky. Um, knowing some of the people that I know. I mean, I've slept in my salon. I've slept at my job. My kids have slept in the car. We've slept at rest areas. They've been through it all. And I think the other part, you know, to this is that my kids are the face of homelessness. My kids have their own experience of living doubled up. They're the kids that can't say, hey, come on over. And they weren't always that way. You know, they were never that way. And I think they don't really, they didn't understand that. They got to high school and it was one situation that really kind of, um, kind of got us the worst about three years ago. And I get a little emotional when I, I talk about it because I worked really hard to give them this beautiful life. And I, I had that for them and it went away, literally the drop of a dime. And then to literally find out you're homeless while my son was away at the summer games for special Olympics. My other son was at school. My daughter and I were on a work trip. We came home to no home to beg people to pack up what I had that was on the middle of the street to live on somebody's couch, to beg people to put out an air mattress for your kids to sleep on. It's not ideal, but it's also not ideal for kids to have to hide that in the school system. And I think the bigger picture to living doubled up is I don't think people understand how many kids in CPS are, are homeless and doubled up. You know, they're, they're living two, three, four, you know, families at a time. That's kind of what we were doing. And I think um, it's just important, I think, for people to understand that doubled up just doesn't mean, oh, hey, you don't have a place to live. You can go live with your family. It's not always that way. And even if you are living with family, um, that's not ideal. It's not ideal to have your kids sleeping on a floor, or sleeping on a couch or whatever that, you know, that situation can be. So I think it's really important for people to genuinely see that the faces and the ways that you can be homeless um, are different and they're vast. And my kids have experienced them all. I've experienced them all. And, you know, that doubled up, I think, is one of the biggest misconceptions of being homeless. It's not your home. At the end of the day, you're at the will of anybody that is the, whose home that is. They decide they don't want you there. They want their friends to come over. They want, you know, a social life. You and your kids are back out on the street. And that happens a lot. Yeah. And I just, I think, I think for me, my hope is that people just truly see and really understand and, and find the resources to know that doubled up is still a form of homelessness, but it's one that we can help. I mean, I think it's one of the biggest things and the biggest misnomer, but I think it's one of the things that when we talk about city, county, state government resources, it's one of those things that are actually one of the easiest to fix because those are the ones that actually most people know about. They just choose to ignore. And that includes the VA, because I will tell you the hardest thing to navigate was the VA. It took two years in the VA to get housing. And that's, you know, it's, I think the hurdles for homelessness happen and what happens is, is that the hurdles are so big that homeless people quit because it's so hard so the help that needs to happen and the resources that need to happen i think um are easily they're not easily fixable they're very complex but i think some of the resources that can be available the data is already there i think it's just a matter of really hoping that somebody's not gonna put politics before people well, that's a great transition to bring in Alderman Martin to this conversation. So hearing these stories and how does it impact how you see your role as an alderman in addressing homelessness and why did you get involved in this issue and what do you think the city needs to be doing to address it? One thing that really stuck sticks out to me in terms of what Ronald said towards the end of it, his most recent remarks were the fact that he wants to help somebody. Um, and that's what I view 
my role, my office's role to do. And I think, look, everybody here, we have our own story to share and our own roles to play. And I think my office is, is, has a role to play as well when it comes to being that first point of contact that so many folks in the community have with government. A lot of folks reach out to our office not knowing which other government entities to turn to, but in Chicago, especially folks know their older people um, more than most any other um, position in government, perhaps with the exception of the mayor. Um, and so it's been a, a real privilege, but also a, a true frustration in a very deep way, both before the pandemic and during the pandemic to speak with residents who oftentimes are reaching out to us in a true moment of need, in a moment of crisis. It's not as if there's kind of a runway saying in a number of months, I'm worried that I might be in this place and I want to talk through options. Oftentimes it's someone comes to the office um, uh, talking about um, issues of domestic violence that they were just subjected to and needing rapid rehousing that day, needing help to um, uh, transport their kids in a safe way to that um, new, new place, that new home today. And so it's, it's, I'm glad that my office has been in a position consistently to help folks in those one-off ways. But I also know that the folks who reach out to us in many ways are the tip of the iceberg. There's so many folks who, for various reasons, don't or can't reach out to an older person's office, or when they do, maybe despite best efforts, we're just not able to find help as quickly as we want to, and more importantly, as, as, as quickly as, as they need us to. And so when I think about what we can be doing both short-term and long-term, it's taking these stories, looking at the data, like Melody said, and, and really identifying, well, what are the policies in place? What are the actions that we can take um, in our positions as representatives and leaders, working not just for folks, but with folks? And so I was really happy um, last year when um, Chicago received almost $2 billion in federal funding to fight to ensure that we got more resources allocated to rapid rehousing, and especially permanent supportive housing that had been the case um, any time previously. Those are really, I think, once in a generational opportunities to invest significantly in areas around housing and homelessness and many others as well. But I think that's an especially critical need during the pandemic. Um, but we also know that those funds sunset. Um, they're they're going to um, uh, run out before too long. So what I'm also working with many of the folks in this meeting and others around is the Bridge Chicago Home Initiative to make sure that we have significant and stable sources of funding to address this issue. Because whether you're talking about the dignity um, that, that, that folks um, need and deserve when it comes to access to quality, affordable housing, um, that's absolutely critical as we've heard. But also we know when it comes to government resources that the outcomes oftentimes are so much more robust when we are office offering folks access to that housing, whether it's in a rapid way, a permanent way, particularly folks who may have mental health issues, substance abuse issues, to have the wraparound supports that permanent supportive housing provides is absolutely critical on multiple levels. And so I think it's going to be really important that we not just focus in the short term on spending those federal funds, funds in a thoughtful way, but we also make sure that as they run out, we have that new funding stream ready to pick up the slack. Great. Thank you, Alderman. Uh, Ronald and Mel Melody, um, can each of you really briefly share what's happening in your lives right now? Um, let's start with Ronald. Right now, um, as I kind of intimated before, I'm just trying to pay it forward. I volunteer a couple times a week at the local food pantry that not only distributes food four days a week, but also serves lunch to the homeless from 11 to three or something like that. And ironically, one of the reasons why I say that I'm where I'm supposed to be at this apartment in Bronzeville, the church is where I grew up at. The church is where I graduated from in May of 1968, St. James Catholic Church. And so things have come full circle and it's like, I'm always seeking opportunities to partner with somebody else. Um, CCH introduces and invites us to programs where other like organizations with the same common goals of ending homelessness and 
de developing uh, permanent supportive housing uh, exists. So um, I'm just having, hmm, I never thought about it, but I'm having fun meeting new people because I'm a quiet person. So I'm not going to go out and, and, and seek new relationships. But this um, so far, I have found this is a friendly environment and people are welcoming and they're looking just to see well, what are you doing and maybe we could partnership and uh, share our common goals and ultimately eradicate homelessness in our lifetime. That's great. Thanks, Ronald. Uh, Melody? Yeah, I mean, just like Ronald, I mean, currently, again, I'm I, through, I think, community advocacy, I grew up in the Native American community growing up. Um, my mom worked for the American Indian Center. Um, I was sitting on the board of directors and ironically, two months after my mother passed, they offered me um, a job. It was a job my mom held a decade before and 15 years before actually. Um, I was the interim and now I was placed as, as the permanent executive director and I, just like Ronald, I think for me, it's all about that give back. Um, growing up in a community that continues to do that, you know, as a Anishinaabe woman, you know, a Native woman, what we do, you know, we're in a seven generation culture. And I think for me, it's really huge to give back to others, not just to Natives, but to also non-Natives and those around me. So, I mean, um, we do a lot of social services. I just created a, a curriculum called Food as Medicine. Um, which offers indigenous food boxes and teaching people how to decolonize their diet, how to cook their food. Um, we also have luncheons that we do for our seniors and our elders. Um, we do a lot of youth advocacy and have a brand new youth council here where they just won youth council of the year through the Unity uh, Incorporated National um, Organization. Um, we just, we house so much here. And I, I think it's, you know, I don't want people to think of the American Indian Center and my job as just a title and a nonprofit. I, I would hope that people can look at me as a human being, um, as a woman of color that's serving her community in the best way I know how. Now I get to use my story um, that I'd never done before. And hopefully that helps the next victim. And, I, and I've, I've talked to people in, in parts, right? So parts of my story have been shared. Um, depending on the situation now, I guess, because I'm out there, um, I get to use that. I hope as the executive director of a nonprofit and working with other nonprofits as I do, um, especially in Indian country, but here in the city of Chicago and our diverse communities, um, that the stories resonate with everyone, that that strike of resiliency, that that goal that we're working with all the aldermen of all 50 wards, that all 50 aldermen are really listening and they're paying attention, that you know all the homeless shelters are changing policies that really need to help families and single people and men and women. And so I, I just, I guess for me, I will continue to advocate. I will continue to be out there creating social justice and um, around homelessness, around veterans, PTSD, domestic violence, um, food insecurities, that's, that's what I do now. And, you know, currently I uh, just got a new house and I'm recently <laughs> engaged. So, you know, life's been pretty good for me. That's wonderful. Thanks so much, Melody. Um, let's see, this question is going to be for anyone uh, to answer. Uh, how, excuse me, how can art help move the needle on social issues like this book can help us do? I take a stab at that, Doug. Um, art is a fantastic medium. It's a means of communication. It's like learning a foreign language or you'd rather hearing a foreign language and not knowing what is being said, but art gives you that visual impact and it allows you to interpret. It allows you to feel what the artist may have been feeling. It's a way of conveying a message in a colorful way, a way that stimulates, a way that provokes you to think about something from a different perspective. It's invaluable. Um, I wish I had more art in my home. Um, I've got a lot of bare walls, but art is warming. It's cathartic. And uh, yeah, it's an invaluable, invaluable medium. First of all, Ronald needs to come hang out with us over here because we, we create art all the time. So you're always happy oh, okay. to come show over here. I'm going to take you up on that. 
You should. And, you know, I think for me, we, we have an art gallery here, but we also provide art programming. And a lot of the people that um, are a part of our art program are homeless veterans. They're, you know, homeless natives. They're, we have poets, we have storytellers, we mm. have artists, we have so many people here. We're doing a project with Chicago Public Art Group. Um, public art and the city and DKs and their work with public art, um, especially around homelessness, but just around mm. these cultural issues. And I think some of these key issues too, right? That, we, that we've all mentioned before, um, domestic violence, you know, being a vet, having PTSD, you know, job insecurity, you know, education and inequality, you know, all, job insecurity, all of those things actually lead to perfect mediums of art and are actually displayed in art all throughout the, the city in different values and, and venues. You know, I actually used to live three blocks from Tent City. Um, mm. I actually have been over there. And part of my work here when I was still a volunteer at the Indian Center is we actually used to go deliver 40 boxes of food to Tent City every week um, from, you know, COVID relief funds. And so we get that. And so, but if you'd seen some of the art in Tent City on their walls, it's amazing. And it's the way that they interpret themselves and where they are. And whether it's on a sidewalk or it's on a wall, art is huge. Sometimes it's just in listening to a story. And as a native person, I mean, we storytell all the time and that's part of our tradition. And I think it's huge. Um, and it's not to be ignored. And I think that's something that I've actually brought up to Aaron Harkey actually at DK's um, is about doing more um, public art around storytelling versus physical art. Cause sometimes I think we, we put the emphasis on physical art versus that oral art. Um, and it loses its value. And because someone may be homeless or doubled up and they don't have the, you know, they can't fill out the application the right way. I, I think there needs to be a program ran through DKs in regards to homelessness and how we get to share another version of art. Great. And one of the wonderful things about this book is marrying the visual art, um, the photography and the narratives and stories of folks who or photographed. Uh, Ronald, uh, Alderman Martin and Jeff have both mentioned the Bring Chicago Home campaign earlier in our conversation. Um, can you just talk a little bit more about what that is? Bring Chicago Home campaign is, in my lifetime, in my time with Chicago Coalition, has been one of the most aggressive um, initiatives so far. It's um, an effort to get a real estate investment tax, REIT, uh, imposed on million dollar or more properties so that they, we could use that money as a dedicated revenue stream. And that word dedicated is operative because we do have monies, as Alderman Martin said, that was granted to us within the last year but it was discretionary. What we need is dedicated, which means no one else can mess with it and it's gonna go to housing initiatives. And that's where we're at. And I wanna thank Alderman Martin for his support and all that he has said about um, the process. But one thing I would wanna iterate is that to all of the folks who are listening, if you want to find out more about it and see what you can do to ensure that that gets passed, go to the Chicago Homeless website at Chicago, chicagohomeless.org, www.chicago.org, and type in um, real estate investment tax, and you'll learn a little bit more about it. I also suggest that you call your older person and get them on board and let them know that it's something that is necessary. I mean, each of our various wards, and I'm trying to get the figures on that, but each of our various wards has a certain number of homeless folk, and we see them every day. Um, and that is an invisible population, but they don't have to be. They don't want to be, and they need our help. That's great. Thanks, Ronald. Uh, Alderman Martin, um, can you add anything about what you think viewers can do to get involved in addressing the issue of homelessness? 
I think Ronald covered many of the key things that could be done like right now, which is one, bringing yourself up to speed in terms of what the a proposal entails. Reach out to your older person's office and not just um, uh, ask or demand that they support it, but I think also asking, well, what are they working to do in concert with other city folks and neighborhood organizations to address homelessness? Um, because I think part of it is not just short-term, but long-term getting folks um, uh, to really acknowledge and embrace the fact that homelessness is an urgent issue. We have lots of tools at our disposal. Bring Chicago home is a critical one. So if they're not supportive right now, maybe a question is, what needs to happen in order for you to be supportive of this? Do you need additional information? Do you need additional time to digest? And if so, we'll follow up. Um, I think that can be absolutely critical. And then of course, continuing to keep tabs on the coalition because as we continue to work towards um, of bringing about this critical initiative, there are gonna be more and more opportunities for action and folks can certainly opt themselves into receiving that information so that they know, um, regardless of how much time they have, um, that there will be opportunities that they can be slotted into to make a meaningful impact. Great, thanks. Uh, Jennifer? Great, yes, we do have some questions that have come in from the audience chat, so I'll just, uh ask a few of those. A uh, few people have asked this in a couple of different ways, but what is the most effective way for Chicagoans to help with this issue day to day, long term, and in our own community? Anybody want to take a stab at that one? I think really it just starts in your community. It genuinely starts with, you know, reaching out to those community organizations, um, your local churches, your nonprofits, every, you know, your community centers. I think that is a huge place to really start. Um, and then, you know, you get tied into the bigger, you know, um, organizations like CCH and Volunteers of America, and, you know, your older person's office. But I, I think the way you start in that day to day is reach out to those community organizations and really whether it's food insecurity, helping with a soup kitchen, helping um, with you know food or, or or clothing or whatever the need may be, if you know of a family that's doubled up and they need school supplies, you know, help those organizations provide those resources um, right there on the front lines. It's that grassroots that's really helping, I think, the homeless community right now. I echo. I'd echo what Melody was saying. Thank you, Melody. Um, resources, that's the operative word. And oftentimes we think of resources as financial. But resources is your time. Volunteer, do something. The beginning starts with you. Do something, say something. Simple, it's not difficult. You will be rewarded, you'll be blessed. I guarantee it. Sounds like you know the most important thing is just starting, right? To do something. Absolutely. Um, we have a question for for Jeff. Jeff, you mentioned several drivers of homelessness, such as domestic violence, uh, etc. Can you share some other drivers of homelessness that you saw amongst your subjects during the project? Yes, uh, you know, we talked about with Maxica uh, illness. You know, a, a very serious illness wiping out. She was saving up for a house. She lost everything because she had to pay for her chemotherapy and other treatments. Um, and that's how she became homeless. Uh, so so um, loss of job, uh, like Ronald, like what happened to Ronald, he was worked for decades uh, as a college advisor here in Chicago and lost his job and wound up temporarily homeless. He's rebounded beautifully. Um, what else, gay, young gay people coming out to their parents uh, when they're teens. And in some cases, the parents saying, get out. So, so teens, you know, LGBTQ uh, teens leaving, um, you know, leaving their homes. Death of a spouse or a parent. We saw that with Tom, that uh, as, as a kid, his parents died and he was homeless. Um, let's see, a lot of it's affordable housing is an issue in places like Chicago and Los Angeles because the rents are so high. And there are people, I photograph people who have full-time jobs that can't afford the rent. 
I, I did photograph one woman who's in the book who was a CNA, a certified nurse's assistant. If you look, they typically make about $12, $13 an hour. You try paying the rent on that. She works 40 hours a week in a nursing home, you know, and either lives in a tent under the Kennedy or, or in her truck. Uh, so, um, you know, those are some of the drivers. Doug, I'm sure you've got some more. Well, the only thing I would add to what Jeff said, and those are all big drivers. Um, you know, when it comes to health issues, it's not just a person's own health issues, but health issues in the family. Um, when other folks, uh, parents, children are dealing with difficult health issues that can lead to homelessness because of medical bills just mounting. Um, and that can be a big issue, you know, and then building off what Jeff said about uh, people working but still not being able to afford housing, you know, there's a figure out there called the housing wage that is uh, an hourly rate that it takes to be able to afford uh, an apartment. Um, in Chicago, uh, a person needs to be making $22 an hour to afford a one bedroom apartment at market rates. And that's well above what minimum wage is. So it's a real issue for folks who are employed but just simply don't make enough money to afford housing. information. And I think we have time for one more question. This is um, from Melody. Some folks in the chat are also veterans, and they are wondering if you could speak specifically to the challenges for veterans and what we should be doing for veterans who are experiencing homelessness. Yeah, I mean, it's a huge, There, it's very complex issue. Um, the VA, I know, works for some, but it does not work for all. It's not a one size fits all. Um, I know COVID has kind of lessened some restrictions, but I think the complexity is of um, just even the VA system for veterans is really, really difficult. There are other organizations like Veterans of uh, Volunteers of America. Um, I actually started working with an organization called Homeless Veterans um, in America. So if anybody needs information on that, by all means, you know, reach out to me I'm here at the American Indian Center. Um, it's melody, M-E-L-O-D-I at AICChicago.org. You can always email me and I can um, hand you out some additional veteran resources for homelessness. But um, we're actually going to be starting um, a talking circle here, a veterans talking circle. Um, so it is open to veterans as well as, uh, you know, native, non-native. Um, whether you're homeless or not, come on in. You know, it's, it's almost like a 12-step program here, right? Like if it's AA, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you need to come and you need a resource and you need a warm place and a hot cup of coffee and you just want to talk, you can come here and we can talk and we can find you all the resources in the world. Um, the great thing about being a part of a community center um, for me is that I have access to additional resources that weren't necessarily available to me. And I think those challenges um, need to be described. And I, and I will say I'm, I'm saddened that our city actually doesn't do more for its veterans. Um, it's, you know, the city government isn't built to really handle veterans the way that they should. Um, the federal government isn't handled to, to handle veterans the way that they should. And, um, you know, it's, it's no different than being doubled up, right? We know how many children in CPS are doubled up, but how many of those families are being reached out to by city, state, or local government to house those families. Because here's the thing, you can house someone, what is the point of housing somebody in affordable housing if there's no job, if there's no education, if there's no way for them to sustain that housing, there's no point in giving someone housing. If there were a hundred caveats, you can live here and then here are your hundred rules that you have to follow, you're putting people in prison and you're taking away their freedom. And most people would rather be homeless than to live under someone else's rule. And so th there, there needs to be, instead of a pipeline, I hate the word pipeline, it has to be a pathway, a pathway to life sustainability. And in order to do that, that's where we start reaching out to these community organizations. And for veterans, our network is huge and vast. And I, I learned that in this process and also just being a veterans coordinator um, in a previous you know, job. And so there are resources out there. And if you don't know what they are, I'm more than happy to share. Um, I'm always willing to jump on anybody's commission or, or 
committee, you know, for help and resources. So please reach out to me um, if anybody has any other additional questions. Thank you. That's great. Um, I think that that is all the time we have for today. But Doug, I want to give you an opportunity to make a few closing thoughts. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for tuning in um, to this wonderful conversation. I wish we had more time. Uh, just a couple of quick things. I encourage you, if you have the opportunity, to get to the Catherine Edelman Gallery, where Jeff's work in the book is on display through February 15th. It'd um, be great to be able to see it there. Also, um, buy the book, Faces of Homelessness. Um, you know, Take what you heard in this conversation tonight. Take what's in that book. Have conversations with others about the nuances of homelessness to really start to raise awareness and help take action. Uh, Chicago Coalition for the Homeless is going to be doing community conversations about the book and, and the book photography in the coming months. So visit our website, chicagohomeless.org, to learn more about that and more about the issues that we talked about tonight and the Burn Chicago Home Campaign. And finally, thanks again to the Chicago Public Library and all our panelists uh, for being part of this conversation tonight. Thank you so much, Jen. We really are happy to be a part of it. And thanks so much to Jeff, Alderman Martin, Doug, Ronald, and Melody for a wonderful discussion tonight. Thanks to Julie and Michael at the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless who helped to put tonight's event together. And thanks to the CPL tax and staff working with this event to make it happen. You can see, remember, the Faces of Homelessness exhibit through the end of February at Catherine Engelman Gallery. And don't forget to check out Jeff's book at your local Chicago Public Library branch. To learn more about how to get involved in addressing homelessness in Chicago, visit bringchicagohome.org or chicagohomeless.org. And a reminder that tonight's event will be available for on-demand viewing on the CPL YouTube and Facebook channels immediately following. So please tell a friend. Don't forget to check out more events, reading recommendations, and so much more at shypublive.org. Thanks for being here tonight. Have a great one.